The Pizza Hut delivery driver made his way down the quiet, abandoned road. He quickly realised he'd gone the wrong way, so swung into a grassy area to turn. As he did so, he noticed an object outside of the car. He stopped and got out, and as he made his way towards the object laying in the overgrown grassy area, he stared in horror as he realised he was looking at the burnt, ashy body of a human being. This is Red Rum. Stories about the true victims of crime. On the morning of the 18th of June 2010, Cherry Walker was with her support worker Paula. They were both walking to the car in a parking lot when they were approached by a man. Paula confirmed she was Cherry's caregiver and then the man identified himself as an investigator and handed over a subpoena to Cherry. Cherry didn't understand, so Paula explained what the subpoena was about. The father of an 11-year-old boy she sometimes babysat for had filed custody paperwork back in March stating he had photographic proof of abuse, of bruises and bite marks that this child's mother had inflicted on their son. His mother was Kimberly Cargill, Cherry's neighbour and friend. In May 2010, the youngest of Kimberly's children was removed from her home and placed in her mother's care. The hearing for the custody of that child was scheduled for June 2010. This is when Cherry got given that subpoena, which said that she would have to testify at the custody hearing. Paula read the subpoena to her and explained that she would need to go to court and speak about Kimberly and the children. At 10am that morning, Cherry made her first phone call that day to Kimberly, but as she was working, Kimberly hadn't been able to take the call. Cherry called back two minutes later and this time decided to leave a voicemail. She was extremely upset and left a message saying that she'd been given a subpoena to testify in Kimberly's custody battle. It wasn't long before Kimberly found a moment to check the voicemail and she called Cherry right back. The pair spoke for just under 10 minutes and during this conversation, Cherry's caseworker Paula was with Cherry and had heard what was being said. Paula could tell Cherry was upset and decided also to speak to Kimberly to find out exactly what was going on. Kimberly explained the situation. She needed Cherry to keep quiet. Quote, if they find out something is wrong with her, they'll take my kid away from me. Then Kimberly suggested she could hide Cherry at her house so she wouldn't be around to testify. Paula told her that was a really bad idea and Cherry could get in a lot of trouble. Over the course of the day, Kimberly and Cherry spoke on the phone a number of times and as well as this, Kimberly called her attorney to discuss the subpoena and custody battle in general. Altogether, Kimberly made 78 phone calls over the course of her 10-hour shift. Meanwhile, Cherry's day continued as planned. Although she was obviously anxious and worried about the fact she may have to testify in the custody battle, she'd made plans and her daily routine was an important part of her care plan. Paula had been at Cherry's house to support her, as she did most days, and just after midday, she and Cherry drove to the salon where Cherry got her hair done. Cherry spent around two hours in the chair with her hairstylist. The pair chatted and the hairstylist noticed that Cherry was her usual cheerful and talkative self. A few hours later, Paula took Cherry to see her supervisor to help start the motion rolling on contacting the assistant district attorney to help explain the situation with the subpoena and ask that Cherry has some support given her mental challenges. After that, Cherry was dropped off at home and headed inside. She was still worried about testifying and just before 8pm that night, she called Paula. She told her that Kimberly had invited her to go for dinner and asked if she could clean her house and that she'd pay her well. Cherry added that she didn't want to see Kimberly. She wasn't hungry as she'd just eaten and wanted to stay in. Paula told Cherry to stay inside and go to bed and just before she hung up the phone, she reminded Cherry not to answer the door if Kimberly came round to the house. She was worried because she knew Cherry was easily misled. The following day, June the 19th, 2010, Cherry's stepmother, Ruon, called Cherry's phone but there was no answer. Both she and Cherry's dad, Gethry, were already worried at this point because Cherry hadn't come to church as planned that morning. This was very unlike her and they knew something was wrong. Ruon and Gethry headed round to Cherry's apartment. They knocked on the door and waited, but after a few minutes and no sign of Cherry, Gethry pulled out his key and unlocked the door. They realised pretty quickly that Cherry wasn't there, but oddly, there were a few things out of place. Nothing outwardly suspicious, but they knew Cherry. She was obsessed with cleaning and everything was always in its place, especially whenever Cherry left the house. 
The fact that the ironing board was still out and Cherry's bed was unmade made them immediately concerned. Ruan checked for signs that her daughter had simply gone out. She always took her cell phone and her coin purse, both of which were nowhere to be seen, so it did seem likely she may have gone out on her own. Even so, both Ruan and Gethry were worried. Meanwhile, just across town, around 10 miles from Cherry's home, a Pizza Hut delivery driver was dropping a pizza off in a part of town he didn't know too well. He made his way down the quiet, abandoned road, but quickly realised he'd gone the wrong way, so swung into a grassy area to turn the car around. As he did so, he noticed an object outside of the car. He stopped and got out. As he made his way towards the object laying in the overgrown grassy area, he stared in horror as he realised he was looking at the burnt, ashy body of a human being. He got straight back into his car to call 911 and waited for the authorities to arrive. With no ID on the body, detectives had a tricky time in initially identifying who it was and eventually had to use dental records to do so. It was 3.20pm when the body was found and by this time, Ruan and Gethry were growing increasingly concerned for their daughter. By the following day, Sunday the 20th of June, the news was out. A female body had been found nearby. Gethry saw the news report on his TV and his heart sunk. He had a bad feeling he knew who the body belonged to. He called the sheriff's office to inform them that his daughter was missing and to ask if the body they found might be her. It was on that same day, Father's Day 2010, they informed Gethry that, yes, the body found was the body of his daughter, Cherry Walker. The autopsy confirmed homicidal violence, signs of asphyxiation, abrasions of forehead, nose and cheeks. Cherry was found upside down and there were drag marks. The autopsy showed there was no soot in her airways, so she was already dead before she was set alight. Detectives found a huge amount of evidence at the scene. There was a rolled up carpet next to Cherry's body and a used coffee creamer container. There was more rubbish nearby, but the coffee creamer container stood out specifically because it looked pretty new, whereas the rest of the rubbish looked as though it had been there a while. Detectives caught a break when they discovered tyre tracks nearby that had been well preserved because of the nature of the dirt. They took mould impressions and saved them for a time that they'd have a comparison print. Cherry's family, friends and the people who knew her from the community were shocked and completely confused. Cherry was a quiet, caring person who kept out of trouble. In fact, she hated any kind of confrontation or tension. If someone got angry or yelled at Cherry, she'd become very upset and start shaking. It's noted at trial that those who were close to her noticed Cherry became childlike in these kinds of situations. She didn't know how to fight back, so would just sit there and take anything that was said to her. Someone wanting to hurt and ultimately kill Cherry wasn't only devastating, but utterly confusing. Cherry Walker grew up in Amarillo, Texas, living with her stepmom Ruan and dad Gethry, who worked as the pastor of the local Greater Love Temple Church. She attended the John Tyler High School but wasn't able to learn to read or write and with her parents and teachers quickly realising she wasn't like other students her age. She had an IQ of 56 and by the time she graduated from high school she had a mentality of a nine-year-old. Cherry's determination and drive to be her own person pushed her to work on getting her driver's licence. Alongside that, Cherry had begged her parents to let her move out and live on her own and in 2009, she enrolled in a community access program where she met Paula Walker, her caseworker. Cherry's parents knew that with the right support, she'd have no problem in living independently, and so she soon moved out and into her own studio apartment. With the help of Paula, who was with Cherry for around half of every day, she would be supported in her everyday activities like shopping and cooking. Generally, Paula was supporting Cherry towards living independently, the two got on well and Paula noticed that Cherry was childlike. She also loved money and cleaning. She didn't have a lot of money and was living on food stamps, but she did love to spend whatever money she had on cleaning materials. During her time living on her own, Cherry's days became pretty routine and she would go to the bank, gather quarters up and take her clothes to the laundrette, and occasionally she'd treat herself to her favourite Papa John's pizza or Church's chicken breast. 
Her other favourite thing to do was to walk down to the local Dairy Queen in the beaming sun and buy a blizzard to walk home with. It wasn't long after properly settling into her apartment that her neighbour Kimberly Cargill asked Cherry if she would babysit for her. The first time wasn't a one-off and it wasn't long before she was asking Cherry to babysit almost every day. Cherry didn't know much about Kimberly. She knew that Kimberly lived next door, she worked as a nurse and that she had two children who lived with her, but she didn't know much more. And when Cherry's caseworker Paula learnt about the childcare services Kimberly was asking of Cherry, Cherry assured her that she wanted to look after Kimberly's children. She loved it. Sometimes she'd look after one and sometimes she'd look after both. Sometimes because Kimberly was at work and other times because she was just socialising. Whatever the reason, Cherry didn't care. She loved to look after the little ones. Paula, however, was a bit suspicious of the arrangement. Cherry needed support herself to live independently. It didn't seem responsible that Kimberly was leaving her children in the sole care of Cherry and doing it so often. Paula wouldn't learn the extent of who Kimberly was until much, much later. Back at Cherry's home, officers checked in but found nothing suspicious. There was no sign of a break-in and no sign of any kind of disruption in the home. But the answering machine was blinking and there were two messages. When the police checked them, they heard a message from Cherry's caseworker, Paula, quite normal as Paula would check in on Cherry at regular intervals throughout the day. The second message was from Kimberly, saying she was on her break and needed Cherry to call right back. The detective's first job was to eliminate this potential person of interest, and so they took a look into exactly who Kimberly Cargill was. Detectives needed more information and asked Cherry's caseworker what she knew about her and Kimberly's relationship. Thankfully, Paula kept extremely detailed records of all of Cherry's interactions, and in particular, her involvement with Kimberly and babysitting her youngest child. Investigators asked to see her notes and discovered that Cherry started casually looking after Kimberly's children in November 2009 and things quickly progressed to a two-week block of childcare in December. Throughout January and February of 2010, Paula had made a number of notes detailing Cherry looking after Kimberly's children, including feeding, washing their clothes, buying toys and caring for one of the children when ill. Paula had been concerned about the childcare arrangements, considering Cherry needed a considerable amount of support herself to live an independent life. It was also towards the end of February that Cherry's doctor told her it was proving to be too stressful for her to look after the children. But Cherry didn't know how to say no to Kimberly, so continued care through the following months. Detectives needed to know more about the woman letting Cherry take care of her children. What was her home life like? And what could a possible motive have been? Kimberly Cargill was born in Mississippi and moved to Texas with her mum and stepdad when she was 12. She settled in Dallas, Fort Worth and quickly became known by her school peers as someone who had a bad temper and would get fired up easily and quickly. Kimberly became a teenager and eventually left school to have her first child, a baby boy. She also married her high school sweetheart. But before long, the pair divorced and Kimberly started taking classes at community college. She wanted to become a nurse, but ended up quitting before finishing. She then became a receptionist at a law firm and whilst working there met Mike West, the son of one of the law clients. The pair got married and had a baby son together, but the marriage didn't last because of physical and emotional abuse between both of them. Around this time, Kimberly was sent to a psychiatric facility and diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but was eventually discharged. At the same time, Mike had been granted sole custody of their son and this made Kimberly furious. Mike knew that him having sole custody was the right thing, but he worried about the visits that his son would have with Kimberly. Mike knew of her fury and temper firsthand and was terrified that something might happen to his son. His worst fears were realised one day when his son returned home from a visit to Kimberley. He revealed that his mum had hit him with a hairbrush and choked him. After that, Kimberley was only allowed to see her son on supervised visits and over the following years, she saw him less and less. Soon after, Kimberley's friend introduced her to a man called Brian Cargill. 
They went on a double date and hit it off immediately. After just three months, Kimberly became pregnant again and the pair decided to get married. They had a couple of years of a difficult marriage before deciding to get divorced and go their separate ways. It wasn't long after that that Kim moved to Tyler in northeast Texas. Whilst there, she studied to become a listed vocational nurse. She also met her third husband who she became pregnant with, but the pair got divorced. This was Kim's third divorce, but this time she was allowed to keep the children in her custody. Meanwhile, her previous husband had met and married a woman called Sonia. Kimberly became wildly jealous of Sonia, and over the next few years, she wormed her way into their lives, eventually befriending Sonia's ex-husband. Kimberly made it her task to get back into Brian's life by whatever means possible. One day, Kimberly went to pick up her son from Sonia and Mike's house. She also had been asked to pick up Sonia's daughter, who she was taking back to Sonia's ex-husband. She grabbed Sonia's daughter and pulled her hard. Sonia saw this and was obviously horrified. She ran up to Kimberly and grabbed her daughter, but before she had time to properly grasp her daughter, Sonia was pushed down by Kimberly. Kimberly then carried on, this time kicking her in the stomach and then pushing her backwards against the wall. Kimberly's own son ran out towards the end of the driveway to try and get help, but no one was around. Seeing that, Kimberly stopped assaulting Sonia and shouted at her son to get in the car. Obviously, by this point, her son was scared of what his own mum had just done to his stepmom, so refused. With that, Kimberly pulled him towards her, made her way to the car, and then chucked him through the open window and into the car. She got into the driver's side and sped off towards her home. During another visit, Kimberly hit her second eldest son so hard that he ran out of the house and down the street. He called his dad Brian to come and get him and told him what had happened. Brian called the police and when they turned up at Kimberly's house, she told the police she wanted to press charges on her own son because he was the one who had hit her. She had no injuries and her son was visibly shaken and had bruises on his neck. He didn't ever want to see his own mum again, but because of the court-ordered custody agreement, he was forced to go back to Kimberly's house. A few years later... A witness had seen Kimberly sitting in her car in a parking lot where she had her son on her lap. She got so frustrated at her son that she opened the door and literally threw him out and onto the ground. The witness that saw this happen was her boyfriend at the time, Matt, who later said that he never wanted to be in a long-term relationship with Kimberly. But once he'd met her son, he felt a sense of responsibility. He saw how Kimberly treated her own son and couldn't leave him to fend for himself. Whilst in a relationship with him... Kimberly told Matt that she couldn't get pregnant. It turned out this wasn't true and she had only told Matt this so that she would become pregnant with his child, something she hoped would keep him nearby and ensure he didn't leave her like the other men in her life had once they'd seen her true colours. Kimberly gave birth to another baby boy and Matt decided he had no choice but to stay in Kimberly's life to be able to make sure his son was okay. But it wasn't long before Matt realised that he had to get out of the relationship and take his son with him. During one of his son's visits to his dad's, Matt decided not to take him back to Kimberly's house when it was time to return, and instead made his way to the court to talk about his options. Unfortunately, Matt wasn't granted custody, and actually because of him not returning his son when he said he would, it didn't look good on him, and the court didn't grant him guardianship. But he did spend the next couple of years fighting for full custody, he was determined to continue until he knew his son was safe. Each time his son came back from a weekend at Kimberley's, he would be covered in bruises or cuts, and it was clear Kim had been abusing him. Soon after that, Kimberly met another man, Forrest, who had a son of his own. The pair got married, and after Kimberly again said she couldn't get pregnant, she, surprise, became pregnant with Forrest's baby and gave birth to another son. The relationship ended soon after that, and after an incident where Kimberly hit her youngest son in front of Forrest, he took his son and moved into his mum's house. Kimberly then made it her mission to destroy Forrest's life, and told his ex-wife about Forrest's alcohol and drug abuse, both of which weren't true. Unfortunately though, Forrest's ex-wife became terrified that this was true and got an emergency court order to take his son away from him. Thankfully, it wasn't long before Forrest was able to prove, through various means, including a number of drug tests, that none of what Kim had said was true. 
He got his son back and told Kim there was no way she'd be able to see her son. He was worried for his safety. It wasn't long, however, before Kim did lose custody of her two eldest children and so was only able to see her two younger ones. Even though she'd lost custody of two of the four children she had, she still treated the youngest two awfully, often hitting and choking them as well as emotionally abusing the pair. It was clear to detectives that Kimberly had a violent and aggressive background and they knew that she may be the suspect they were looking for. They were told by Paula that Kimberly had wanted to see Cherry that Friday night and that she may have been the last person to see her alive. Kimberly initially denied seeing Cherry that evening. She told detectives that she tried to get Cherry to go out to dinner with her but hadn't ended up going. She just went home, had a quiet evening and tried to have an early night but kept getting woken up by the medical centre calling her. The next morning, Kimberly ran into her neighbour Lauren at around 7.25am. Lauren was pulling into her driveway as Kimberly was pulling out of hers. Lauren asked her what she was doing out so early and in response, Kimberly said she was just going to clean her car. She added that she hadn't slept well and that she'd been kept up all night by work calling her. Later that Saturday, a full day before it was publicly shared that the body found deceased belonged to Cherry, Kimberly had called her old high school friend Suzanne. The two had spoken for a few minutes before Kimberly revealed that her babysitter had been found dead at the side of the road. It was suspicious because at this point, Cherry hadn't been formally identified and as she had no ID on her, there was no way anyone could have known that. On further investigation, Officers looked into both Cherry and Kimberly's phone records. They soon discovered that the day after Cherry's murder, the same day her body had been found at 3.20pm, Kimberly hadn't called Cherry's phone at all. This immediately piqued the investigators' interest given that the previous day, there were a huge amount of phone calls between the two of them. What was also suspicious was the fact that between 8pm and midnight, Kimberly didn't answer her phone to anyone despite a number of phone calls from the medical centre she'd been working at earlier that day. Staff at the hospital were confused by some of the records kept by Kimberly that day. It wasn't clear if she'd given certain patients medicine or not. One of the staff members who tried to call Kimberly did note it as odd that Kimberly hadn't answered her phone for such a long period of time. She'd called Kimberly a number of times previously about similar issues and she would usually pick up quickly. Kimberly had eventually called the medical centre back at around 12.30am in the early hours of the 19th of June, saying she hadn't answered her phone because she'd been asleep. Officers decided to go and question Kimberly in an informal setting. They arrived at her house on the Tuesday, four days after Cherry's murder, and asked if they could come inside. Kimberly wouldn't let them in and told them to leave. And although officers did initially leave, they quickly returned and set up surveillance nearby her house while they waited for a search warrant. At this point in the investigation, they didn't have enough evidence to arrest Kimberly for Cherry's murder. They did, however, arrest her for injury to a child. This was based on the ongoing case with the previous abuse of one of her children. The main points for consideration on this charge were one or more of the following in relation to her children. Being choked, she did it regularly and would also pick them up by the neck or use belts to wrap around their necks and choke them. Throwing a knife at one of the children. Throwing anything she could get her hands on. Verbally abusing her children, calling them stupid and swearing at them. It's reported she wasn't secretive about it at all and did it very publicly. Taking her children to the streets of Tyler, dropping them off, only to return hours later with no explanation and no consideration for their safety. It was also alleged that she'd been physically and emotionally abusive to her ex-partners, including the fathers of her children. While Kimberly was in jail, she incriminated herself a number of times. It's almost as if she forgot the calls she made from inside of jail were recorded and monitored. She called her friend, Suzanne, the same friend she'd first told about her babysitter being found dead, and asked her to go to her house to clear out a few things, which she did. She also asked Suzanne to change her passwords online and to call her number and delete any messages. Kimberly's phone had been confiscated by officers at this point, so Suzanne would have to do it by calling the voicemail box from her own phone. Meanwhile, detectives were building their case against Kimberly. Witnesses had reported seeing a white SUV near the crime scene, and Kimberly owned a white SUV. Once the search warrant was granted, 
Forensics made a cast of Kimberly's car for comparison to the imprint taken at the scene. They also got to work on the rest of the car, where they found black soot which matched the crime scene. On the headrest of the passenger seat in Kimberly's SUV was an African-American hair that was compared and found to be a match to Cherry's. Once investigators were able to gain entry to Kimberly's house, they found the house to be incredibly difficult to sift through because it was so dirty. Kimberly was a hoarder, so the sheer amount of things in the house was overwhelming. It was also super grim. It was filled with piles of dirty dishes, toys, clothes that needed washing, rubbish, used toilet paper on the floors, plastic containers, and where curtains or blinds would usually go in the windows, there were sheets or items of clothing draped over instead. Interestingly, however, the bathroom was spotlessly clean. There were bottles of bleach and bathroom cleaner, and investigators also confiscated a pair of white tennis shoes that had traces of the same black soot that was present at the crime scene. In the washing machine, there was a freshly washed sheet with a deep red stain on it. Even though it had been washed, it was still stained and it was taken for forensic testing. Perhaps one of the most damning pieces of forensic evidence was that cream coffee container that had been found at the scene. That was just the bottom portion, but the top portion was found to be a match and was located on the driver's side floor of Kimberly's car. Kimberly protested her innocence at first. She told them she had proof she was at home, alone, and she said she texted her friend Michael and those messages would show that she was in. The messages spoke in quite specific detail. She texted Michael saying, you didn't stop by Friday night or Saturday morning. It was clear to the investigating team that these messages were sent in an attempt to set up an alibi for herself. They went on to ask Kimberly why she hadn't worked on Saturday. They'd been informed she'd turned down a shift and took off Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Kimberly's colleague had already confirmed that she would work whenever she could and would constantly agree to working overtime or extra shifts, so the four days off in a row was unusual. Kimberly swore it was just to prepare for the upcoming court hearing concerning her children, but again, officers didn't believe her. And once they presented her with the mountain of growing evidence, Kimberly changed her story. She did admit that she'd been with Cherry that night. She said that she got to Cherry's house at 8.25 p.m. She said she waited outside in the car because Cherry was ironing her clothes. At around 8.30 p.m., Cherry came out of her house and Kimberly took her to dinner. But on the way, they stopped at Kimberly's house to meet her friend Bill. Bill, however, didn't turn up. Kimberly went inside her house to charge her phone and go to the toilet while Cherry waited in the car. Kimberly left her phone on charge while she and Cherry went for dinner. She said they had a nice dinner for about an hour, and on the way home, Cherry asked to be dropped off at a bar where she thought some of the boys she knew would be at. Kimberly didn't want to go, and she just started driving to Cherry's apartment. Cherry got very upset that Kimberly hadn't listened to her and started to have a seizure. During the seizure, she hit her head on the window. Kimberly didn't have her phone on her, so she couldn't call for help and didn't know what to do. She said she panicked and wasn't thinking rationally. She then admitted that she did drive right past the hospital, but said she was in the wrong lane and didn't want to hold traffic up. Eventually, she made it back to Cherry's apartment block, where she got out of the car and knocked on a number of doors, but nobody in the whole entire apartment block answered. When Kimberly got back to the car, Cherry was apparently still having a seizure. Kimberly opened the door Cherry was leaning against and she fell out of it and hit her head on the floor. After being prompted, Kimberly acknowledged that she is a licensed vocational nurse and that she checked for a pulse and to try and administer CPR, but it didn't work. She lifted Cherry, who at this point had completely stopped moving, and put her back in the car. She said she then drove towards the hospital, but changed her mind last minute because she knew Cherry was dead and had been dead for a number of minutes. She thought the hospital would blame her and she didn't want to look bad. She knew there was nothing that the hospital staff could do, but they would blame her for Cherry's death. Kimberly then drove around for 45 minutes around town while she decided what she should do. The next moment, she realised she'd ended up on a back road near to Cherry's apartment. She then dragged Cherry out of the car and, in a major escalation of events, doused Cherry with lighter fluid because she wanted to eliminate her DNA from her mouth from the alleged CPR attempt that no one believed. 
Safe to say detectives didn't believe this new version of events, but with the information Kimberly had given them, they were pretty confident that the case would do well at trial. It also became clear that the day after the murder, Kimberly had washed all the clothes she was wearing, left her home and headed for the White House police station. She entered through the main foyer doors and asked the receptionist if they'd found her dog. She claimed the dog had been missing two months and she wondered if it had turned up. She went on to ask if it had been a slow day for the police department. What she was actually doing was fishing for more information about the potential murder investigation. During that following day, Kimberly also attempted to create a false alibi by telling some of her friends she hadn't taken Cherry out for dinner and that she'd not seen Cherry at all. That friend Bill that she'd mentioned earlier to police told them that Kimberly said Cherry had gone to eat with a quote white man instead of her. At Kimberly's trial, prosecutors wanted to show the jury that Cherry had been intentionally killed and that the seizure story presented was utter BS. Cherry's medical records were shown to include a self-reported seizure two times, which she had anti-seizure meds for. She had also been prescribed another medication in 2004, which had side effects of possible seizures. At trial, the pathologist testified it was highly unlikely Cherry died of a seizure. It was presented that although Cherry may well have seizures, and although it was possible to die from a seizure, Cherry's doctor didn't think that was likely at all. He'd not ever seen death from a seizure, and Cherry wouldn't have seizures if her meds were taken consistently. On top of this, there were no abnormalities shown on Cherry's brain scan. He ended by saying that death from seizure only really comes when there are underlying issues, of which there were none identified for Cherry. Kimberly's friend Bill was called to testify, and he revealed that Kimberly had told him she was scared that if the courts found out that Cherry was mentally challenged, she'd lose custody of her children. The court also heard how Kimberly's colleague Angela had spoken with her on the day of Cherry's murder. Angela said that the conversation between the two of them was mainly about the babysitter, and that Kimberly said, quote, she is going to ruin me or destroy everything. Angela went on to testify that sometime after the murder, Kimberly had told her that she tried to take Cherry out to dinner so they could discuss some of the questions that might come up, but that, quote, the babysitter could not go out. She said that the babysitter told her that she wanted to go out and get her a white man, then she asked me if I heard her, and she repeated it again. The forensics evidence was pretty solid, too. The coffee cream container found next to Cherry's body at the crime scene showed that there were two DNA profiles found. Kimberly's DNA couldn't be excluded with a 1 in 226,000 chance it was Kimberly's DNA. In May of 2012, Kimberly was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to death. She has since had her appeal refused and is being held at Mountview Unit in Gatesville, Texas on death row. This is Red Rum. Stories about the true victims of crime – 